All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida to participate in this very auspicious occasion. Uh, it's so humbling and so exciting to be here to help commemorate the 64th anniversary of the Tallahassee bus boycott. Uh, my name is Paul Ortiz. I'm a pr professor of history and director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at UF. And I'm just so excited to be here, um, to be a, the chance to work with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor and Dr. Keith Parker, uh, Dr. Larry Rivers, uh, Shauna and other amazing uh, organizers of this event. So again, thank you for, for having us. Um, um, I hope that we can say you're in for a real treat for our panel. Um, in a few moments, you're actually going to hear firsthand uh, oral history interviews read by students and staff of the Proctor Program at uh, UF. Uh, they will be reading from oral histories that I conducted during the summer of 1994 under the direction of Professor James Eton, who many of you know uh, was an amazing uh, scholar in the United States and also the, the founding director of the Black Archives at Florida A&M University. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about really the multiple legacies of the Tallahassee bus boycott from a historian's perspective and also how it was I came to do oral history interviews uh, with some of the amazing uh, organizers of the boycott. Uh, people like Mrs. Mary Ola Gaines, uh, Mrs. Laura Dixie, Cornelius Speed, Professor Charles Smith, um, and really uh, Daisy Young and, and, and a number of other individuals. So I wanna talk both about the, the history of the boycott, the lessons for today, as well as give you a bit of a preview uh, for the interviews that you're going to hear our students uh, performing in just a few moments. You're going to hear and see um, the voices of people like Reverend C.K. Steele, um, Henry Steele, uh, Reverend Henry Steele. You're going to see some video images and photographic stills that are gonna kind of take you back on a, a, a time uh, travel, if you will, uh, back to Tallahassee in the 1950s uh, what the city looked like on the eve of the boycott, uh, and then also some um, uh, reflections on what's happened since that time. So what I'd like to do today is really to talk about the origins and precursors to the Tallahassee bus boycott, something of the boycott itself or something about the boycott, and the many important legacies of the Tallahassee bus boycott um, in the 64th anniversary of that. And I wanna start with the takeaways. Uh, I have four takeaways in my presentation. Takeaway number one is that the Tallahassee bus boycott was preceded by years and even decades of African-American resistance to segregation that occurred long before 1956. I talked about this in my dissertation and in my first book, which was titled Emancipation Betrayed. Um, I relied heavily on people like Mrs. Gaines uh, Mrs. Uh, Laura Dixie, Sam Dixie, uh, A.I. Dixie. Um, a lot of uh, narrators from this area helped me develop this argument. The decades of resistance leading up to the boycott were what helped make the boycott such a long-lasting and impactful event. So these earlier events, and I am going to refer to some of them, involve African Americans refusing to move to the back of the bus in Tallahassee long before 1956. In fact, we know thanks to the testimony of people like Ms. Daisy Young, uh, Sam Dixie Sr., which you're gonna hear from soon, um, people were refusing to move to the back of the bus in this part of Florida um, as early as World War II. Uh, many African-American soldiers, soldiers and sailors uh, and Marines uh, refused to move to the back of the bus during World War II. Uh, and why shouldn't they? they were risking their lives in defense of their country. African Americans have fought in every war in this country's history. And so the idea that you could prevent them from enjoying the rights of full citizenship seemed to them uh, to be immoral. Another aspect of, of this history is that black Floridians did not need to be woken up in 1956. Again, there were decades and decades of resistance to segregation, to the indignities of white supremacy. 
uh, Bethel Baptist Church, Bethel AME, uh, other churches, uh, labor organizations, uh, fraternal orders, kept black dignity, mutual aid, self-respect. Uh, black businesses were very strong in this area. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that we remember that there was a life of democracy and civic engagement among black people before the 1956 boycott. Takeaway point number two, the Tallahassee bus boycott involved the sustained mobilization of an entire community for over a year. And I want us to think about how challenging that is. Last year, uh, one of our main speakers talked about how difficult it is to get 2,000 people into, uh, into any kind of uh, a setting today. Uh, whereas during the bus boycott, if you look at photographs, there were literally hundreds of mass meetings. And I want us to think about the kind of work that that takes for that kind of organizing to happen. And just because one was black doesn't mean that one supported the boycott. The boycott had to be organized. The main organization, of course, was the Inner Civic Council, founded in 1956. When I interviewed Mrs. Dixie, and you'll hear an excerpt of that interview in a few minutes, um, she was still a member of the Inner Civic Council, and this was in 1994. So that's an organization that lasted literally decades uh, in Tallahassee. That was the main movement organization. There were others, but the Inner Civic Council was kind of the umbrella boycott movement uh, organization where people would meet, um, raise resources. There was always donations being taken. You had to, to get collect money to pay for gas, to pay for cars, to help transport people, to help uh, uh, raise food and things like that. So another related point I wanna highlight is that organizers here in Tallahassee learned very important lessons from their brothers and sisters in the Montgomery bus boycott uh, that had occurred a year before. And we know that most historians are very familiar with the Montgomery bus boycott because of a young man by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, Reverend C.K. Steele, as we know, knew Dr. King. And uh, there were many people from Tallahassee that went to Montgomery during the Montgomery bus boycott and kind of saw the lay of the land, saw how people organized the boycott there and took those lessons to Tallahassee. Now in turn, going back a year earlier, the organizers of the Montgomery bus boycott went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where there was a long, um, albeit unsuccessful bus boycott in that Louisiana city. So what I'm suggesting is that organizers were learning from each other in different Southern cities how to organize a boycott, how to sustain community mobilization. That's the most challenging thing. How are you gonna convince a person who has to make a five or eight mile trek to their jobs to not take the bus? Are you gonna tell them walk in the Florida sun? Think about that as an organizing challenge. You've gotta find an alternative way to get that person to their job, to their family, to their church, so on and so forth. Um, we know that the boycott involved organizing carpools, alternative transportation routes, because the police were always harassing you, right? Um, it involved funding for gas and transportation expenses to keep the boycott happen, happening. None of this happened organically. It had to be systematically created day in and day out. One of the jobs that Mrs. Laura Dixie had, by the way, as a rank and file organizer, was to go from bus stop to bus stop to say, brother or sister, uh, ma'am, sir, we are boycotting the buses. We ask you to not get on the bus until we win justice. And so imagine yourself as an organizer trying to make that argument to keep the boycott going. That's what you had to do every day, every hour. It started the first moment the buses started and it only ended when the buses stopped running. We had to have people at every stop to make sure the community respected the boycott. So takeaway number three, the bus boycott occurred in one place and one time, but it left a tremendous legacy that really contributed to the forward momentum 
of the black freedom struggle and the civil rights movement. What I mean by this is that in the short term, the legacy of the 1956 Tallahassee bus boycott was that it helped give rise to a very active movement, not only in Tallahassee, but in, in the Gulf South generally. It paved the way for the creation of very strong Congress of Racial Equality or core civil rights movement chapters in Leon and in Gadsden counties, for example. The Tallahassee bus boycott helped pave the way for the founding of the Southern Christian Leadership Council, which again, we associate with Dr. Martin Luther King, and Ralph Abernathy, uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth, but let's not forget that Reverend C.K. Steele was a co-founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization, by the way, that's still in existence. So SCLC and CORE, two very important civil rights organizations given critical impetus by the bus boycott. In fact, a few years later, and I want us to think about the intergenerational legacies and lessons of the civil rights movement. Because remember, I started with the idea that black resistance to segregation didn't start in 1956. It goes back decades and decades. Equally important, the, the high tide of this phase of resistance to segregation, the Tallahassee bus boycott, leads to the flowering of new civil rights organizations. And it makes it so logical that someone like Patricia Stevens, a young Florida A&M college student would end up in Tallahassee. It makes it so logical that her future husband, attorney John Dew, would end up in Tallahassee just a few years after the end of the boycott and begin to organize a new generation of civil rights organizing. But what I want us to understand is the connections between the boycott in 56 and the lunch counter sit-ins in the early 1960s. I think there's arguably an organic connection between those two phases of movement building. The last takeaway point I wanna share from you is possibly the most important, which is we can choose to become part of the legacy of the Tallahassee bus boycott today. But what does that mean? It means modeling the same behavior that people like Mrs. Dixie, Mrs. Gaines, Daisy Young, uh, and others will be hearing from modeled. What that means is that being concerned with the well-being of our communities, it means standing up for social justice and for the poorest members of our neighborhood. Remember, the bus boycott success was premised on the self-activity of the poorest people in the community who, were, who needed the public transportation system to get from point A to point B. These were not individuals who owned motor vehicles by and large, right? Um, college students were important to the boycott. In many ways, they initiated it, but there were simply not enough college students to actually carry out a successful boycott. You need to what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. taught us a social movement requires, right? Which is the labor and love of the PhDs and the no Ds. And again, what I want, us, want to emphasize is I want us to think about what we would have done in 1956. Would we have participated? Would we have taken the risk? Many of the organizers suffered violence. Many of them were arrested, harassed, or even beaten by the police. Would we have had the courage back then to do what they, what, what they did. But even more importantly, possibly, what are we willing to do now to ensure that social justice uh, reigns and that all people are treated uh, as, God, as God's children with dignity and respect? So I want to begin to moving towards a conclusion and to talk about um, how it was I came to Tallahassee in the summer of 1994 to do some of the oral histories that you're going to be hearing um, uh, presently. So I was a grad student at Duke University. Um, I was part of a, an, a big oral history project sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it was titled Behind the Veil, Documenting African-American Life in the Jim Crow South and it involved sending graduate students like myself 
all across the South to do oral history interviews with African-American elders in the early 1990s. The idea was to, to try to understand what life was like before the advent of the modern civil rights movement, you know, roughly around the time of the Tallahassee bus boycott, Brown v. Board, the, the uh, Greensboro sit-ins in 1960. We were trying to get as much of black history before that time as possible through the memories and recollections of African-American elders. Uh, we interviewed Professor Eton. I can tell you uh, from a firsthand uh, experience, uh, James Eton was a wonderful mentor. He was a great, great human being. Uh, he did so much work, as many of you know, to really get the black archives up and running. And it's a testament to his legacy that the black archives today is really thriving. Um, I was thrilled to be able to give a lecture there just a, a couple of months ago. So in 1994, getting my time capsule, you know, uh, time travel machine, um, I am a second year graduate student working under James Eton in the Black Archives at Florida a campus, uh, a team of three grad students. We all stayed on campus in the dorms. Uh, James Eton gave us a large list of African-American elders to go out and, and to interview. Um, and immediately I realized I was in a community in Tallahassee and Leon County and neighboring Gadsden County. Uh, I was in a, in, in a remarkable community. Um, people talked so highly immediately about people like Reverend Steele, uh, Coach Gaither, uh, Daisy Young, uh, a lot of the, the kind of legendary um, ministers, you know, uh, women's leaders of, of fraternal organizations. Um, I remember the first time I went to Laura Dixie's house and I got there, believe it or not, through what we call in the oral history world as a cold call. Um, I called a union, I called the union headquarters of the American uh, Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, or AFSCME. And I called up the office, the AFSCME union office. I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here in town for a period of time. Uh, I'm trying to do oral histories with black elders. Uh, do you know of anyone I should interview? And right away, uh, the AFSCME union people said, you've got to interview our founder, Mrs. Laura Dixie. And I went out to interview her and it was transformative for me. Uh, it changed the rest of my life because I had the opportunity to speak firsthand with a woman who, when she passed away, many of us remember Reverend Holmes of Bethel Baptist, who called Laura Mae Dixie the mother of the movement in Tallahassee. Uh, she was an incredible person. Uh, remember now, the boycott was in 1956, and I interviewed her in 1994, and then interviewed her, and then my uh, students have had the chance uh, to interview her before she passed away. Uh, she had just as much energy in 1994 as I think she had in 1956. Mrs. Dixie was always looking out after people. She was always visiting elders in nursing homes. She was always checking in on neighbors. Uh, she was always making sure young people were being taken care of. She was always going to, to classes to talk about her life history. In other words, Laura Mae Dixie modeled that kind of behavior that I think we want to try to model today. And she, uh, even though the boycott concluded at a certain point, she carried the boycott's lessons with her for her entire life and then taught them to generations of younger people. Um, I also had the chance to interview uh, her husband, Sam Dixie Sr. Uh, and many of you will smile as you hear this because you know that they were a remarkable couple. Uh, they had a marriage which lasted uh, almost half a century. Um, they hosted in their house Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who stayed there. Uh, they hosted a number of other people uh, the community that they're in, um, which we call now, my understanding is near the Gaither Golf Course, but um, a very strong black uh, working class, middle class neighborhood. And I was just so honored that they took me in in 1994 and really almost adopted me as a member of the family. Um, they insisted that I stayed with them every time I would come during the summers to do research. Um, and, and they were so welcoming to me, and then again later to my, um, to generations of my students. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Sam Dixie Jr. and Thelma Dixie, his wife, 
for continuing to make our University of Florida students a part of their, uh, their family as well. So I, I really wanna kind of wrap up here. Um, as you know, historians like to talk and I could continue talking about the boycott for many, many years. But I wanna conclude with the story of a person by the name of Malachi Andrews. And Mr. Andrews um, grew up as a farmer. He was a service worker. And he was a person who grew up in Gadsden County. Uh, his family, they were farming people. Um, in his oral history, uh, which is available now at the University of Florida, and I should say that all of the interviews that you're going to be listening to, excerpts of in a few minutes, they're all going to be accessible, publicly accessible at the University of Florida, the digital collection. Um, and you can contact us if you're interested in, in getting uh, at any of those interviews. Uh, but they'll be fully accessible uh, within, hopefully within the month. But Malachi Andrews, I think about him because um, he was a person of tremendous dignity and bearing. Um, he began talking about um, African-American resistance to segregation coming from Gadsden to Tallahassee really in the 1930s. Um, he took part in the bus boycott. He was never a public leader. He wasn't charismatic. He didn't give speeches, right? But he was one of those rank and file organizers who helped do the day-to-day -day work that the, of the boycott that needed to be done. And so I wanted to pay my respects to Mr. Andrews and to just read um, a portion of his excerpt. And this is going to get us into a transition of what you're going to be hearing in a few minutes. So I interviewed Mr. Andrews on August 9th, 1994. And I started by asking Mr. Mr. Andrews, Andrews, when you are began riding bus to Tallahassee and you were forced to stand up. Did you or any other black people um, vocally say anything to the driver or voice your opinions? Now remember, this is in the 1930s he's talking. So Mr. Andrews responds as following. Yes, many times. Yes, many times. Uh, I remember one uh, afternoon I was going to my work at uh, a and University and uh, I took a seat up front and the uh, driver told me to go back to the back of the bus. I asked him why. He said because I said so. I said no. I said, I paid my money just like everybody else. I'm going to ride wherever I please. He said, if you don't get up, I'm going to call the law. I said, well, sir, you'll just have to call the law. I'm not getting up. So he got to a little store over town, across town. He jumped off the bus and went in to call the law. So one of the boys on the bus got off and ran into the store to tell the merchant to tell the store operator to not let him use the phone because they're calling it on a black rider. So the man did tell him not to use his phone. So then he had no other choice but to come on and drive the bus around up on the campus. And when he got up in the campus at A&M and got to a phone, I had gotten off the bus and gone to my place of work. And this has happened to me several times. And I know any number of people who had the same problem. Fortunately, when we get to the police department, most of the times they'd ravel it out because they would know where there's no law against it. See, by this time, there wasn't even a law that said black people had to move to the back of the bus. Mr. Gaines and most African Americans in Tallahassee knew that. They resisted, they stood up against white supremacy, and so when those college students took that, the, the stand that they did against segregation, an entire community was ready to get behind them and to organize the Tallahassee bus boycott. The best thing we can do today is to remember the boycott, to commemorate it, to commemorate those lessons and bring those lessons into our everyday lives. So thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you for the honor of having uh, me and the Proctor program with you today to commemorate the anniversary of the Tallahassee bus boycott. Uh, of course, you know that in 
December of 1955, that was uh, nationally uh, uh, publicized bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. Well, five months after the be beginning of that, two uh, co-eds from A&M were put off the bus because of sitting in the front, because of their refusal to give their seats to whites, and they refused to give them their money back, and they were arrested. And it was from that incident that we organized the Inner Civic Council. First meeting we had as a, an interdenominational fellowship of ministers, what we call the Ministers Alliance, uh, met at Bethel AME. Uh, I happened to be the president of the interdenominational ministerial alliance at that time. We met at Bethel AME and uh, we took cognizance of the movement that had actually started on campus. All the ADM students was involved. And uh, all that day I heard them talk about what had happened on the bus. So they said, we call it a mass meeting tonight at Bethel Baptist Church. And uh, well, I had a few customers that I had to finish up, and I was a few minutes late getting there. Dean Thomas, did you remember Dean Thomas? Mm -hmm. Dean Thomas and I walked in the church house together. And uh, by this time, a young man from uh, Miami, Odell Jones, see, they, they had nominated all the officers, which was what nine of us, I believe, they president, vice president, uh, treasurer, whatnot, secretary, Dr. Even C. Williams, secretary. And Odell say, I nominate Brother Eddie Burns to be the, the assistant secretary. That was the last uh, uh, person that to be, uh, officer that to be elected. So everybody just went to pieces. I said, now what do I know about <laughs> talking to myself? What do I know about being a doggone secretary? And something said, go ahead on and accept it. The people like you. And Reverend Skill said, Brother Barrington, will you accept that? I said, yes. But uh, when the, when the Inter-Civic Council or the, uh, well, the, uh, the movement, I guess, started uh, as it did in Montgomery and coming over to Tallahassee and the like, I think we can say that the, the forming of the Inter-Civic Council uh, became a new construct in the social life of black Tallahassee and I would say of the sympathetic community, non-black. Uh, the Interdenominational Alliance, Dr. James Hudson was president of it. Uh, we called a meeting of leaders. We appointed a committee to go see the city manager and the manager of the bus company to see if we could get some understanding, which we did not get. We reported to a mass meeting that night, at which time they voted to come off the buses, which demanded some kind of organization. I remember the very first day of the bus boycott in 1956, as was mentioned in the film. My brother and I, my younger brother Clifford and I were on our way home from school and uh, and on this particular day, we decided to take the bus home. When the bus left Bond community, came back through FAMU, and we were coming along Boulevard right there at the set, and students were in an uproar on both sides of the streets, yelling, get off that bus, get off that bus. And uh, immediately we knew what had happened, that a boycott had been initiated here in Tallahassee, uh, led by the students at Florida A&M. 
So as soon as the bus turned down Palmer and we got to Adams, off we came and walked the rest of the way home. We have to believe, and that's what two young, beautiful FAMU students did on that Saturday, May 26, 1956. Now, no, I wasn't there. I was not an eyewitness. I wasn't even a twinkle in my daddy's eye. I didn't get up, come along until later, a few years later. But it didn't matter. Ms. Wilhelmina Jakes and Ms. Carrie Patterson, they got sick and tired of being sick and tired. That um, citywide bus had whites only and colors only sections. And if the white section filled up and if the white people needed a seat, the colors had to yield their seat for the whites. And if the colored section was full, they had to stand up. So they got sick and tired of being sick and tired and having to follow that. So one day, they decided to pay their fare. And as, um, as um, Gerald, the late Gerald Easley put it in the uh, Democrat article, they plopped down in the whites only section and sat right next to one of our good white sisters. Now, I can't tell whether the sister had a problem with that, but the bus driver sure did. He had such a problem that he drove to a gas station. They didn't have cell phones in 56. He drove to a gas station and called the police, and they were promptly arrested. They were charged with the potential for inciting a riot because, they, because of where they sat. But these sisters, these young FAMU graduates, which I am a graduate, a proud graduate of Florida A&M University, these young ladies were woke. They were woke before woke was cool. They were woke before woke was even a thing. They were woke because they knew what was going to happen, and they were ready for it. Because, you know, the, the uh, bus boycott was already going on in Montgomery. So they were doing it in Tallahassee. They were woke and they were ready. And I'm sure they were aware of what could possibly happen when they did this thing. But it didn't stop them from being disruptors. <laughs> Dr. King stated that for evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men or women to do nothing. Nothing. Stay woke now. He also said that nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. That, those words right there just resonate as we work in our communities and we see this even now. But these ladies did something by getting themselves arrested. This woke up the whole community, but most especially Florida a and Florida a and started this bus boycott under the leadership of their SGA president. The students circulated petitions, and according to the Tallahassee Democrat, 2,300 students showed up. They showed up. In 1956, 2,300 students showed up. Can we get 2,300 people to show up for a good cause now? I'm looking at this room, and thank you all for being here. But this place should be packed. This because of what happened. But we're, we've gotten comfortable. We're going to talk about that. We've gotten comfortable because life is good. But if we're not careful, and if we don't stay woke, it could change in the flickering of an eye. So the bus boycott began on May 28, 1956, and lasted until December 22nd, 1956. Now, in my mind's eye, that's what the preachers say. I know some preachers in the room. In my mind's eye, y'all say, I can see that empty bus rattling through campus around the, the set or whatever was going on in 56. Empty, because people were walking and they had their own carpools and they refused to ride the bus because they were protesting. If we can get a couple of people to just agree to do the same thing at the same time, We'll make progress, but we seem to have a little problem even today doing that. So I admire and I applaud the efforts of those students. That's why it's important to keep young people involved because they're not afraid. We're afraid because we don't want to lose our jobs. We don't want to lose our, our housing. We don't want to lose a lot of things. We're afraid. These young people don't have all that stuff, so they're not afraid of losing what they don't have. The point I'm trying to make is that all these ethnic studies, African American studies programs didn't start from the top. They were not created by college or university administrators. 
They were created by students who came out of the movement, who again demanded to be taught their neighborhood histories, the histories of their grandparents. I could go on and on. I will tell just one more story, and then we'll get right to the panel. Many of you know the name of Howard Thurman, um, known as a spiritual advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King, to Reverend James Lawson, to many others. Howard Thurman was the first African-American dean of Marsh College, and many people gave him a lot of accolades. He deserved all those accolades. But he said, you know, when I think of who taught me to be a liberation, a Christian liberation theologian, I had great education. You know, he knew Mordecai Johnson, he knew all the great religious leaders, uh, theologians of that time. But he always said, Reverend Thurman always said, I credit my grandmother, who had been a slave in Madison County, as being my greatest educator. She never learned how to read or write. She would have me read the Bible to her growing up as, as a young boy. But she always forbade me. I was never allowed to read the Pauline epistles. Why not? Because that was the only part of the Bible that her master in Madison would allow to be read in plantation. Hello, this is an excerpt of Miss Mariola Gaines's interview conducted on August 1st, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection and is read by Grace Chun. And another route I took that went to FSU, that bus driver, he didn't make me get off, but he told me, asked me if I would move, and I wouldn't move. So he drove on around and he stopped and went in places. He wanted me to think that he was going in to call the cops. And I told him, I said, the cops look just like you to me. I don't mind facing him any more than I mind facing you. So I don't know what happened to him. I saw him once since then, but most of them was either switched from one bus to another. Hello, this is an excerpt from Mary Ola Gaines's interview conducted on August 1st, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection and is read by Megan Sam. A couple ladies from, I don't know where they lived, young ladies, they got off of the bus and the man must have said something to them and all. And they got off and they come around announcing it all over the street, driving around in that car, and nobody ride the buses because we on strike. And everybody just started, wherever they were, they just started walking. I was downtown, so I walked from down there home. A lot of people walked home. A lot of them walked, and a lot of them didn't walk. That was my first time I'd come to, you know, like organized and all. Hello. This is an excerpt from the Cornelius Speed interview conducted on July 27th and on August 3rd, 1994. This is a part of the Behind the Veil uh, collection and will be read by me, Ksamba Kokai. When the bus boycott came, I was working at FAMU. I was the physical plan director here. I worked here for about 35 years until my retirement, but I operated a service station on the fringe of campus that I had people running around during the day on the corner of Adams and Palmer Avenue as you go down the hill from campus, a golf station. And when the boycott started, my supplier came to me and asked me if I would supply. He was the mayor at that time, and he tried to get me to provide information as to what was going on with the boycott, and I couldn't do that. It was no way I could do that. But in the meantime, the carpool, they were using my station to supply all the fuel for the carpool. I knew who was doing it. I was aware of what was going on, but they would just send a note and say five gallons or 10 gallons. There was no name on the note, whatever. And of course, the fellows who ran the station for me during the day knew that. Once a week, they would send me a check. I would go there, and the check was there. They paid everything they owed. So when they couldn't stop it, Judge Rudd, who was the brother to Representative Rudd, his brother John Rudd, was the city judge. And they subpoenaed me with all my records. And of course, I took the records just like they were. I took all those little pieces of paper 
that's at five gallons, 10 gallons, and they thought they knew who was sending them. And they were absolutely right. But I wasn't gonna convince. There was no name. And my position was, I'm not there. I have no idea who sent the notes. But as long as they paid me, I didn't worry about it. People who were there ran the station. All I did, I went there at night and closed at 10. I would relieve them all at 7 o'clock. And I closed at 10. So I had no way of knowing. They hired an attorney from Tampa, Florida, named John Hawes, who came here to handle the case. And I got there, and he had taken a deposition from me of all these things. Of course, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. So when they put me on the stand with the judge and the attorney and started questioning me, my only answer was, I've told you what I know. I've given you all the evidence that I have. I've given you that. Because on the little book, there was gas, you know. Gas, five gallons, ten gallons, six gallons. 12 gallons, whatever it was, and the total, they paid the total. My point was, I never looked to see who signed the check. The check was there. I just stamped it and deposited it. I never looked to see who signed it. I don't know who signed it. And it was a peculiar thing when they had interrogated me and had another person there who was black who was supporting them in everything they had done, who was also an employee of FAMU, who was supporting them in everything they had done and tried to give them every detail he could to help them and trap me. But when it was over and they couldn't get anything, they had interrogated me for two hours almost and found they couldn't get anything, they dismissed me. And as I walked out, Attorney Rudd came to the door and said, Cornelius, you're the damnedest liar I ever think I've met in my life. And I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> I said, thank you, sir, and walked out. Hello, this is an excerpt from Malakia Andrews' interview. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection, and it's read by me, Charity Kelly. The old trail bus used to run from Tallahassee to Havana and Quincy, and when we would get on these buses, they would make us get up, tell us we can't sit there, and the big question was in my mind, how was it that I was paying my money like them and couldn't sit on the bus and from that we began to resent the action and then they began to call the police and have us snatch off the buses and these types of things thank you hello this is an excerpt from mariola Gaines's interview conducted on august 1st 1994. this is part of the behind the veil collection and is read by megan sam he didn't try to physically move me, he just stood there and talked to me, and went over there and pretended he was calling the policeman. But he didn't call them though, then, and when he did go back over there, they were going back over there and calling them, so I think he must have called them that time. He told the policeman to come on down there, and the policeman came down there to make me move, but you see, I didn't move. And when the policeman got there, he asked me why I won't move. I asked him why did I have to move. He didn't tell me, so I just sat on down. And I told the bus driver, I'm not getting off of this bus until I get where I'm going. Hello, this is an excerpt from Laura Dixie's interview conducted on October 10th, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection and is read by me, Elizabeth Rios Brooks. Laura Dixie says, Mrs. Gaines and I had a run in with the bus driver who tried to put me off the bus that I was sitting inside. Ms. Harris was the director of nursing at A&M. She was a real fair lady, so she was white too. I knew Ms. Harris, and I got on the bus and I sat beside Ms. Harris, and I saw he kept looking in the mirror. And so he stopped the bus and he said, uh, you're going to have to move. I said, why do I have to move? He said, well, you know, white and black, 
don't sit together on this bus. He said, well, if you don't move, I'm going to have to call the law. I said, well, you do you, you do what you have to do, and I'll do what I have to do. And so he got off the bus and uh, I didn't move. And so he got back on the bus. I guess he thought that when he got off the bus to go towards the phone, I was gonna get up. But I didn't get up because I was sitting there talking to Miss Harris, because I knew Miss Harris. So when he came back, well, I'm going to have to call the law. And then Miss Harris said, well, looky here, go and drive the bus, she said. I know her, I'm not white. And he was so, he was so embarrassed. And about two months later, I had to admit a patient. I was working at TP Hospital. I had to admit a patient. And when I went to admit a patient, who's sitting up there to be admitted but him? Thank you. Hello, this is an excerpt from Laura Dixie's interview conducted on August 5th, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection and is read by me, Isabella Oliver. I said, if I can get the floor, I want to get the floor for the first time that night, and I did. I laid my little speech before why we should let Reverend Steely go for the good of what he was doing and not only for Tallahassee, not only for Bethel, for the whole entire nation, because he was going all over the country, raising money, because they were going through a struggle with the bus boycott. They had the carpool going and they had to raise money and Steele was going off raising money, bringing it back here. And some of those deacons didn't want him to do it. And they were trying to railroad him out of that church. But the people that night when I got the floor and I, I showed the people what the benefit now, though that they uh, listened to me, I told them, I don't need a preacher. I got to dictate to where they were going and how. What he is doing is helping the whole entire nation of the black people. And they throw them recommendation out what the deacons brought in that night. They said, let's discuss. And the women took the floor and they ate them deacons and thing up, they ate them up. Hello, this is an excerpt from Mrs. Mary Ola Gaines interview conducted on August 1st, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection and it's read by me, Charity Kelly. Dr. Teeth, Mrs. Gaines, you said on the first incident with the bus, when you refused to move to the back, you called Reverend Steele. Mrs. Gaines, no, someone else called Reverend Steele. Some lady was standing across the street. One of the members of his church was standing across the street and saw what was happening. The bus stood there so long. And so after they told her he was trying to make me get off, and I couldn't get off. Most of the bus thought I should move. And so since she went and called Reverend Steele and he called the manager of the place and I never seen that man before, I don't know what happened to him, Dr. Ortiz. So Reverend Steele called the manager of the bus, Mrs. Gaines, of the bus and him that his manager are not being treated right and he wanted to do something about it. Thank you. Hello, this is an excerpt from Mariola Gaines' interview conducted on August 1st, 1994. This is a part of the Behind the Veil collection and is read by Sandra Romero. And so the other was about six, I think, and the bus driver made me move my seat because I wasn't supposed to be sitting with white folk. That's what he said. And I told him, I said, I'm responsible for these children and that their mother knows that they're on here. So we didn't get off the bus, but he moved the children. He made the two little boys, those six and seven year old boys, five and six year old boys. He made them move up to another seat. So I went home and told her about it. And her husband went and I ain't seen him no more since. Her husband went down, blessed them out. And they told Mr. Carter, said, I don't want to have to come down here no more because we sent those children for a bus ride and I want my maid treated right. So I didn't see no more of him anymore. Thank you. Hello, this is an excerpt from Samuel Dickey's interview conducted on August 5th, 1994. This is part of the Behind the Veil collection enjoyed by me, Omad Sanchez. Like I said, I had a lot of crucial experience by being a man. Uh, I guess my mind recall, I was coming out of Wilmington, North Carolina, 
1942, coming home at the early age of about 21 and 22, and coming home on a forlorn coming out of Wilmington. The bus was loaded, and I, I was there, was one seat vacant, and that was beside a white girl, and some white soldiers, some white sailors, uh, was sitting behind her, and one seat was vacant. I was riding my hand up on the rail, holding, trying to hold on, had over 300 miles to come to Tallahassee, and she looked up. She said, soldier, set aside me, and uh, I sat, I sat down. And the bus driver missed me out of that aisle. He immediately stopped the bus over and once jumped up and run back there and said, get up, get up, get up. You know, you're not supposed to do that. So two white sailors came to my rescue and they said, she told him to sit down there. And what can he do to her? Said, you better get up there and drive the bus. Said, we all in this thing together, we fighting. Say now she asked him to sit down. And now if you, if you can't drive the bus, that bus we will drive and put you off. As that's what they told him. They said, "Sit down, soldier." They pushed both of me to sit down. I was going to get up because I knew to obey. They said, "Sit down. We with you. You don't worry about it." So from Wilmington, North Carolina to Charleston, South Carolina, that's where I had to change. Well, my nerve began to fail because I said, "I don't know what he's going to do when he's getting ready to change. Whether he's going to get a mob." crowd, the soldiers, so I just nipped, and after I get off the bus, you know, trying to get lost well, and same back there before then, I stopped in Georgetown, South Carolina to get a sandwich, and that little pigeonhole you had to go, be busting that front door, the rest they say, go back, go back, go back, go around to the back, and they had this little pigeonhole, and you ordered your sandwich, that was like 42. Uh, that was 42, and I saw several incidents in my life. I mean, you're going to get some crucial times.